listen to your heart. That's where all my best singing happens. You know, it doesn't happen at my mouth level. But in my heart, it's great. The Bible's got quite a lot to say about how we deal with our heart, what it has to say to us, and how we can have it changed. You get a, a clue as to how important the heart is from this little proverb. It says, above all else. That ought to give you a clue that this is pretty important. Above all else, guard your heart. We need to guard our hearts. And why? Because everything you do flows out of what's in your heart. And your, the deepest part within you, the core of your being, is the source of everything that flows out of you. So we need to look after that innermost part of our being. So a couple of things that we can learn from what Jesus has said. First of all, solutions begin with naming the problem. What's the problem? How can you solve a problem if you don't even know what the problem is? It's not rocket science, is it? Solutions begin with naming the problem. The problem is never a person. It's very easy to name a person as the problem. I've got a little list myself. <laughs> Everyone needs to be scratched off it. People have problems, not people are the problem. If we can help the person with the problem, a whole lot of other things get helped. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. Now look at this. He calls the people. He says, listen. He says, understand. So here is something that he really wants us to get a handle on. This is something that's very important to Jesus. So he wants us to grasp what he's about to tell us. And as you've already picked up out of the theme of our service, it's about our hearts. My problem your problem, our problem, anybody's problem is not external to ourselves. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going in. It's not out there that the problem lies. It's all very well and good. Say, oh, the problem is, you know, look, it's education or it's politics or it's climate change. You name it. Some, somewhere out there. The real problem is within me rather it's what comes out from within the person that causes our problems someone else's fault not me it's easy to blame someone else we all do it in fact it's been going on for a long while back in the garden of eden the woman whom you gave me wasn't Adam's fault at all. Actually, it was Adam's fault, but he was quick to, <coughs> to, to pass the blame. He wasn't actually blaming the woman. Who was he really blaming? The woman you gave me. This is all God's fault. It's God's fault that the world has gone pear-shaped. So blaming others has a long history. What do we do? Get out of bed. Bed is where you blame others, where you make excuses for yourself, Deny that I'm the one with the problem. Get out of bed. I love bed. Bed's comfortable. But bed is an unproductive place. You can't achieve things by lying in bed. You can't achieve things by blaming, by excuses, and by denial. Instead, grab your oar. Because when you grab your oar, you take control. You set some direction up in your life. And your or <coughs> excuse me, is taking ownership of your life and of what needs to happen by being accountable, by being responsible. That's when things can happen. It can be a lot less comfortable than lying in bed, 
but it's far more productive and you will achieve far more and everyone around you will be grateful as well. Because why do you need your ore? Sometimes life does this to you. It seems to be flowing along nicely and suddenly the bottom drops out of it and it only gets worse <laughs> and sometimes it feels like you're drowning. Hang on to your ore though and you come through and think, wow, that was some ride. To blame someone else or to blame something that's outside me is to choose, and get this, it is to choose to be a victim. Oh, I'm so helpless in the situation. Oh, if, if only someone had done something, if only something hadn't happened. It's always out there. That's how victims talk. And it sort of overflows beyond that as well. When we not just blame someone, but when we make excuses for those that we love, then what we're doing is keeping them as a victim. Oh, you poor thing. Oh, that's so sad for you. If only so-and-so hadn't done that if only such and such a circumstance. We're making excuses for them and blaming and excuses go together. They belong in bed together. They're bedfellows. And they're not helpful. Fortunately, Scripture gives us a but. And we don't have to live like that because Jesus has come so that we can have abundant life. And so look at this. Who shall separate us from the love of God, Christ? What's going to get in the way to make life difficult for us? Will it be trouble? Yes, there's bound to be trouble. Will there be hardship? Yes, there will. Persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. As it's written, for your sake we face death all day long. <coughs> We're considered <coughs> as sheep to be slaughtered. No, no, that, that is not going to slow us down. No, in all these things, in all of these things, in the problems we face, in the trouble and the hardship, within those things, we are the ones who are more than conquerors. Not because we're good looking or clever, but because of the one who loved us and has given us the wherewithal to make a difference. And we'll go on and see how he does that. How does it work? What sort of practical hints do we get? Now, in world's terms, how do you get from being a loser to a winner? How do you become more than conqueror? There's a, there's a million ways that it can happen. Perhaps the best one is this, this third one here. To go from a scarcity mentality. Oh, I don't have what it takes. I don't have the money, I don't have the intellect, I don't have the opportunities, I don't have... the list is endless. But once you start thinking, I'm more than conqueror, once you start thinking, I'm blessed, then attitudes change and you know you've got what it takes to struggle through the difficulties and to be more than conqueror. External factors, whatever those things out there are, whatever those people are, yes, they do influence you, but they can't control me. Yes, they, they can make life difficult, but they can't control me, and that's why I can't blame what goes on out there. I once saw people playing football inside bubbles like this. It was hilarious. <laughs> they were influencing one another, crashing into one another and bouncing each other across the floor. It was a great influence. But no one else can control what we do with our circumstances. Come back to what Jesus was saying. After he left the crowd and entered the house, the disciples asked him about this parable. Duh! is the Australian translation. Thickos, 
Don't you see that it's nothing outside a person, nothing outside a person that going in can defile them. So once we know the problem, then we get to also know what the solution is. And this is what Jesus is going to go on saying. This is where you've got a lot of blank paper to fill in because you've got some drawing to do. So Jesus says, from within, back to our theme for the day, out of the heart, <coughs> out of the person's heart is where the problems come. And then he lists all that those might be. Now, what does this look like? What do you look like? This is a self-portrait based on 1 Thessalonians 5.23 which says you are made up, all of us are made up of three parts. We are spirit and soul and body. Now leave, your spa leave space to draw lots of these circles because you're going to need lots of them. But get a handle on what that looks like. Spirit, soul and body. The spirit that innermost part of you, that heart, is where you relate to God. It's where you relate to eternal things. It's where you relate to spiritual things. That's the core of you, your, your spirit, your heart. And then your soul is where you relate to yourself. It's where you relate to other creatures, other beings. It's, it's where you have relationships. It's the emotional part of you. It's where you do personal things. This is your, your personality and your temperament, your mind is here in your soul. And then your body, it's how you relate to the external and physical things around you. This is what gets sick. This is, this is what looks so good. This is what carts you, your spirit and soul around from place to place in this physical world. The bad news is everybody starts off with a spirit that is dead. We are spiritually dead is the problem the world faces. Spiritually dead. Not just unwell, not just with some difficulties. Spiritually dead. Now, spiritually dead doesn't mean inactive. If a body is dead, it just lies there and doesn't do anything. But this is not a body we're talking about. We're talking about the spirit. To be spiritually dead, can you read down to the bottom here? Remember our studies from Ephesians. You were dead in the trespass and sins in which you once walked. You were dead in this sin condition, but still very active, still walking around, still doing things, even though your spirit was dead. So spiritually dead is not inactive. It's just disengaged from God. That's what spiritual death is, cut off from God. Now, I need you to get your mind around this. Is this a hard concept? You need to understand this. Spiritual death equals sin. Got it? You there? Yep. Here is... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Spiritual death, your dead spirit, is sin. Sin resides here in your spirit. Now, that's, <clears throat> that's a problem. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's how bad things are in your spirit, in your heart. That's Jeremiah 17.9, if you're taking notes. Now, remember, sin is here in the spirit, but sin never stays put. It's... It's a very active principle. And so sin produces sins. Sin leaks out of your spirit into the rest of you and starts to have a negative impact on our lives. Sin produces sins. Now, there's no end to the list of what sins might look like. 
sin in the spirit becomes sins. Things like, well, the short answer is self-centred. Everything is all about being self-centred. And it comes out in other ways. Greed, lust, laziness, lies, stealing, arrogance, unrighteous anger, blame, self-justification, false humility, putting down others. The list is without end. They're the type of sins. Now look at this person here. This is a self-portrait. So for me, I'm really struggling in this area of my life. Uh, I won't name it as uh, an addiction to chocolate, but you can make your own uh, judgment on that one. Uh, this part of my life's not too bad here. Oh, look, I'm really struggling with this one. Uh, I've got some other smaller issues uh, and some parts of my life. Uh, okay, I look pretty good on the outside. Do you get that? So the sins come in different shapes and sizes. And every one of us has got a different stain of sin on our lives because it affects us so differently. We're uniquely disfigured by sins. And then sins have this problem that they stifle wholeness. Now, <clears throat> you wouldn't call these things on the left sins, but they're sort of knock-on effects. Like, <clears throat> you have unhelpful coping mechanisms. Something goes wrong. You don't respond in sin, but you know, you could do better. You just don't get it right. Um, you have bad habits, inappropriate, make inappropriate responses to what people say and do, avoidance. It's all about having not the abundant life, an unabundant life. It's because the stain of sin is interfering with how God created us to be. And so... <coughs> The problem is, first of all, sin, and then it's sins, and then it's how I'm not able to be all that I could be because of the impact of being simply human. You see how this is getting to be a difficulty in getting to be a sinner. Now, lots of factors determine which are the sins that I'm going to commit. Now, <clears throat> the ones that I commit will be different from the ones you commit, by and large, because you, are, you will sin in your own unique ways. We all do. What's going to cause them? Well, external things either drive you towards sin, encourage you to sin, help you sin, or there's things around you, external things, that either hold you back or stop you from sinning. And, and first and foremost among these are the family in which you were raised. Now, some people, some families have really strict rules. You, know, you will tell the truth or I'll flog you with an inch of your life. Uh, other families, um, yeah, you can get away with quite a good deal. Uh, the socioeconomic conditions, stealing is okay in some families. You know, you're in for all you can get. For others, it's a negative thing. How you were taught the role models that were around you, first of all at home, then at school, and then everyone else. The peer pressure which you came, the things that you participated in or didn't participate in. They're all external things that determine which of these sins is going to have free reign in you, which is going to become your besetting sin that constantly traps you, or which areas of your life are you going to push back against sin. So they're external things, but the problem is not always from outside us. There are internal things that either drive you towards a certain sin or hold you back, discourage certain sins from happening in your life. So for example, here in your soul, your personality, the sort of emotions that you go through, the preferences that you have, what you like and don't like, they're unique to you. The perceptions that you have of people, of circumstances, of the world, of God, uh, how you look at yourself makes a difference to what's going to either force you or hold you back from seeing the addictions that you have, the desires that you have. Again, all this stuff within you is going to shape the way that sin becomes sins. 
Does it have to be that way? In part, the answer is yes. But then we cry out at the end of Romans chapter 7, Oh, wretched person that I am, who can save me from myself? I'm my worst enemy. Is it possible? And the answer is yes. I thank God through Jesus Christ that things can be different. And then that's the end of chapter 7. You get in chapter 8 and it's about the work of the Holy Spirit making a difference in our lives. Things can change for the better. How does it happen? I'll give you three guesses. You know this. A, B, C. You come to the cross. You come to Christ. Admit you're a sinner. That's the problem. <coughs> you have a heart of sin. Not just you've committed sins. That's just the, the consequences. But a heart of sin. Believe that Jesus has dealt with that sin on the cross and commit your life to him as he commits himself to you. There's another way of doing exactly the same thing. The three words God wants to hear. Three little words you, you can say to God. They are, sorry, please, thanks. Sorry for the sin I've committed. Sorry for disappointing your heart. Sorry for breaking you. Please forgive me. I confess my sin. I let go of it. Please take this away from me. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for what you've done. Sorry, please, and thanks. ABC. I don't think God is going to um, mind which direction you arrive as long as you come to him through Christ. So what happens is that something big happens right here in your heart of hearts, in your spirit. Salvation removes sin. Sin is gone. You're no longer a sinner. The bad news is while sin is gone, the stain of the sins that you've learned is still there when you get saved. So we have good news or do we have bad news? The good news is that you're no longer a sinner. You're a saint. You, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. Christ has cleansed you. Your spirit is clean. That's why you're allowed to go to heaven. With, with, without that clean, no one gets to heaven. But there's still things that need to be done in your life to deal with the effect of sins. Now salvation is going to add some resources into your life to enable you to be different. Now this is where it gets exciting. I, I'm really excited by this. What, watch what happens when I press this button because something really, really exciting is going to happen here. Remember, salvation is adding resources. You ready? Three, two, one. Kazowie! Isn't that great? That is fantastic. This is what God is wanting to do in your life. This is becoming the abundant life. Salvation is adding resources. Resources from within, within your heart of hearts. As your heart changes, as the Holy Spirit is taking control and starting to work. He's pushing out the sin that once <coughs> dominated you. And then you've got <coughs> excuse me, external resources that are working from the outside in to make a difference. So these external things, things like you're doing Bible reading, you're going to church, praise and worship makes a difference to who you are and how you function. You pick up better role models once you get saved. This is working from the outside in. And from the inside out, you've got the Holy Spirit who's making a difference. He doesn't want to live in this filth. He wants things to be pure and holy. You had prayer, you have a different world view. You have a different perception of yourself and of what's going on around you. You get wisdom. You're able to confess this sin that you want to deal with. You repent of it and give the Holy Spirit opportunity. Thanksgiving makes a difference and cuts back the stain of sins that's on our lives. What does this look like? Be transformed, and here's the transformation. How? By renewing your mind. 
your mind is in your soul your brain your IQ is sitting out here in your body but renewing of your mind is happening in in the place where it needs to change where you think differently so what's happened and here's some theological words for you salvation eliminates sin sanctification minimizes sins you pick the difference salvation on one hand sanctification on the other salvation eliminates the, the root cause of the problem sanctification is the process of overcoming the problems that have developed right through my life so here's a question for you why are there some nice non-Christians and you know them lovely lovely people but they've got no time at all for spiritual things how can they get to be so nice if they're unsaved on the other hand you probably know some people and please don't name them at the moment where they're saved but they are such a pain in the backside and you think oh, how do I have to put up with this You've, you've got problems. Think how God feels. There's millions of them. <coughs> the answer is, <coughs> why are there so many nice non-Christians? We're all made in the image of God. It's God's character. It's God's nature that's here within the soul that makes them such nice people. And some people non-Christians have been raised in an environment have had the family and the peers and the teaching which doesn't allow sin to run rampant where there is a, an external force of a Judeo-Christian ethic that says you don't lie you don't cheat you don't steal and that's what makes them such nice people they have such nice morals because that's the environment in which they've been raised so that's why they're nice non-Christians. How much nicer they would be if they were then able to be saved as well and, and continue that process. <coughs> now, on the other hand, why are there such painful Christians? Even though the Holy Spirit comes in, there's still quite a lot of work to do here. There needs to be some deliberate choices of sanctification to choose to change to allow the Holy Spirit to choose areas where they need to be different people and to confess, to repent to, to use these external resources of, of Bible study and of helping one another of learning to praise learning to give thanks it'll make a difference in their life. Instead of whinging all the time, I hope I'm not giving away too much here, but look, live it out, folks. Instead of whinging, turn it into praise and thanksgiving and you'll become much nicer Christians. So the question is, who am I becoming? I have got all the resources that I need I don't need to cry to God, oh God, give me a, a spiritual gift. Oh God, give me something else. It's here. It's already here. I've already been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. My, my spirit is filled with everything that I'll ever need through this life and way beyond, more than I could ever dream of using. So I need to be using that to transform myself from the inside and to draw on, make use of the gifts that are here in one another. So, what are the resources I need? Internally, I've got them. You, the very same things we listed before. The Holy Spirit, prayer, look at the world differently. All of these things are changing me from the inside out. The things that come from outside to turn up to church, to give myself over to praise and worship, to look at the people around me and think, yes, that's more like the person I want to be, 
to put myself into reading, understanding, allow scripture to soak through me, to be transformed by renewing my mind. So what's happened? Salvation has given me a new heart. A new spirit is within me. That's, the, that's exactly where Steve started from at the beginning of the service from Ezekiel. We have a new heart. What comes next? Sanctification. We now need to train our mind so that our soul is becoming different. That's the process. It's what you've got and it's where you're going. We've got the new heart. Now we need a transformed mind. Okay? Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the gifts that you've given to us. The wonderful gifts of a new heart. New from within. Father, you have made us different. All things from the inside out have become new. And now we ask that we would have just the grace, the boldness to recognise what you've given us, to look within ourselves and see our new heart filled with your spirit and to allow you, to choose you, to make a difference from the inside out. Thank you too for the way that you're transforming us by placing us into this environment with these people in this church in this praise place may it be that all these things we will draw on to become the people you saved us to be to enjoy life in all its fullness today and every day until we see you face to face through Jesus our Lord Amen